So today is the building's tale. And there's been a, a spate of recent books. This is James Woodhouse and uh, Ian Adley um, uh, on why is construction so backward. There are several books come out at the moment with similar names, which is quite interesting. So it means there's a general kind of swell of concern about this. Now, the reasons that the government should be very concerned is because there are two reasons. One is economic and the other is environmental. Economically, um, it's a very significant part of, of our economy is a construction. Uh, it's a very significant part of global economy, but it's also very cons um, a very significant consumer of energy. That is energy to dig the materials out of the ground, to process them, to form them into uh, building elements, to transport them to the site, to assemble them, and eventually to take them all down again and reprocess them or try to uh, destroy them in some way, or, uh, which is a big problem in Hong Kong, for example. Um, but most significantly, the energy during the period of, of the end of the building's existence. And uh, of course, there's a move to try to produce buildings which are better balanced. But many, many people feel, and it's interesting, um, John Paul's just walked in the room, morning, um, who would argue, I hope very strongly, that buildings should actually act do more than that. They should, over their lifetime, produce a net input of energy, which is more than enough to cover their own energy needs, is more than enough to cover all the energy costs of their own construction and demolition, and has some surplus that can be um, output to other buildings, in particular um, older buildings for which it's more difficult. You've either got to demolish or, or still provide them with energy. Um, so I think that um, new buildings are going to have to have um, a, a nice philanthropic and generous attitude um, to their older neighbours and provide them with the extra energy which they can't manage to acquire for themselves, um, like looking after our ageing population. Um, but this is a big issue in how to do it. There is more than enough solar energy falling on, on a building like this at any day of the year um, to provide enough energy to power it. However, collecting that at a rate which somebody regards as economic at the moment is a different issue. Um, but it's the issue that, that the building, as it were, has to address. And this is why it's the building's tail, because I feel that the building, in this sense, I'm imbuing it with a personality. And the personality of this building is that it feels it must pay its way, that it, it is, feels responsible for the environmental impact it is making, and would like to look after its neighbors as well. And, of course, provide an environment for its users with which they can interact and enjoy. And so the problem in the 60s, to go back to the 60s and the kit of parts mentality, you see what is perfectly adequate as in a child's toy to provide a simple kit of parts, of floors, doors, elements, and roofs, which fit together to make little buildings. This is, this, is, this is Baco, if you've never seen it before. It preceded Lego. Um, uh, but it works in a similar kind of way, it slots on rods. Um, and it's interesting because they did, it, Bakelite had just become a, a material which it was economic to make children's toys from. They couldn't have injection molded um, plastics, the kind of thing that Lego is made of later. There were rubber mini bricks, is the other one. It was just like Lego bits, but you had to spit on them. Anybody remember those? Right, well, um, the problem was this, that, that that mentality, which is fine for a child's toy, is not so good when it's writ large in a building system. This is Jesperson, one of many building systems. Every major builder, building company, and this is from the John Langs, who are one of the more enlightened ones, had one or more system. Um, Jesperson, I'm sorry, Jesperson was one of five that Langs had developed in the 60s and 70s. In fact, they, it was actually developed in, in Sweden and they imported it, hence the name Jesperson. Um, uh, but it works on, on, on a well, first of all, they were under tremendous government pressure um, to industrialise the building industry. But of course, nobody really knew what this, what this meant. And all kinds of concepts were introduced, like metrification was introduced, but introduced in a very strange way, um, and the idea of modular construction. But government pussyfooted around with this and, in a sense, left all these builders high and dry by not forcing the issue through, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, making it very difficult for them to get contracts for local authority housing unless they had one of these systems. 
Um, politically, this was handled extremely insensitively. But the result was um, kits of parts like this. Now, these have all been made in, in the Jesterson factory, and then I think they had four in England. This meant these are, these are heavy, these concrete components. You can imagine a, a, a panel like this with a door opening. There's a great deal of steel reinforcing in here so that this doesn't get broken. So this is an inherently um, structurally uneconomic form before we even begin due to that high distribution of steel, due to the, um, the, 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 the Baco mentality that it has to be one component. And all sorts of complexities of cutting holes in the slabs which of course also need all kinds of additional reinforcement. So it's intrinsically uneconomic construction. And every one of these slabs has to be transported to site using transportation energy and fuel to do so. But fundamentally ill-conceived, but for very good intentions. But this is the thing that troubles me most about it, not just the naivety of that, but the notion that what they did in the factory is they industrialized the easy bit and left the difficult bit to site. Now, it would seem to me common sense that if you're going to do part of the process in a factory and part of the process on site where it's raining and it's under difficult conditions of tolerances and so on, and you can get very fine tolerances in the factory under considerable uh, uh, you know, environmental conditions which are sheltered, dry, warm, temperature controlled, and so on. And these molds, these, these slabs, are made in very, very expensive steel molds. And then to lighten them, they made holes through them. And that meant they had to have hydraulically removable polished stainless steel tubes that went in and out. So the machinery to make these was very, very expensive. So you're making these very expensive components that are intrinsically difficult to make, intrinsically um, difficult to transport, difficult to handle and pick up from the crane. And what happens is this is this is the detail of how they go together. This is the wall, and these little things tuck onto the wall, and there's a bolt in here to the next slab in height. Now, on site, that is a nightmare. It is almost impossible to get at this bolt to adjust it to get the next slab lined up properly. You're having to do it under very difficult and dangerous conditions. And the ones on the outside of the building, not in Jesperson, in fairness, but in another system, um, there were a very serious number of accidents due, due to men having to stand on the edge of buildings while a two and a half ton concrete slab was trying to be maneuvered into place and they had to tuck a flashing in or they had to stand on top and poke a sort of damp proof thing down between the panels. The architects who draw these details had never for one moment thought what it was going to be like on site to try to actually implement the, the construction they had drawn. Nor had they thought of what was going to happen in three dimensions between the vertical membrane and the horizontal membrane. Nor had they thought about the problems of tolerance. These things were never going to line up being realistic. And the dark details didn't do solve the tolerance. So Jesperson has bolts and things, which does that, but it's impossible to get to them. And so what you've got, and also you've got an intrinsically kind of weak joint here. There's very little overlap. So, and as at Ronan Point, when there was a gas explosion, um, they discovered that most of these industrialized systems were extremely vulnerable. It's not just the ones that built Ronan Point, but almost all of them. Today is the building's tail. All these kind of details, they all have some and on them. Just very there's small been a, a state of recent book. Tons from the end of the slab onto the vertical wall. So what they've done is industrialized in the factory, the bit that's easy to do on site, which is make lumps of concrete, where you can make them cheaper. And then in the bit that's really difficult to do, they've left to be done on site. So this is kind of perverse logic. And, and this bedeviled the whole of the 60s and 70s, and basically led to um, a write-off of industrialization. Um, Thamesmead is the example most people know, that at least they built the factory on site. But it's of huge complexity, this project. And, and the complexity of all the different slabs, they didn't use the complicated machinery which was being used for Jesperson. Instead, they're hand wiring and hand fixing all these reinforcing rods, which is enormously labor consumptive. So you've only got the notion. So there is a factory right next to where you're building the, building the house. In order to be able to do it in the factory and then move it and lift it and crane it into sight, all the reinforcing it becomes so much more complicated. 
And then, of course, they embedded all the power cables and things into the concrete, so they're totally inflexible, so you can't change anything later. And then there were these big store yards, of, and then you start looking at these slabs in closer, and you find there's a very, very high damage rate, both on the individual slabs and in the actual construction later. So this kind of epitomizes how not to do it. I'm going to contrast that with um, this little movie from Scott Howe. This was Japanese thinking, um, looking at what was going on in Europe and thinking they could do much better. This is during the first Japanese industrial boom. So these, this, these films are dated. Um, the reason I'm showing it now is that all this work, what, what you're about to see, ground to a halt when the, the bubble burst for the Japanese economy. I think it was about late 80s, I, I don't remember. And, um, but recently, the same companies who were financing this work have started again and employing the same people. Scott Howe is one of the people who's very well known for this, um, robotic construction. Now, I don't have an up-to-date movie, so what I'm going to show you is, is very dated, so don't laugh at it. And it just shows the Japanese approach. They, they had thought, the, the real difference was they were thinking what, what, they, what advantage they could get from making things in a factory. And the thing about this was it takes the part of everything is thought through. The transportation, the fixing, the moving, the whole process is thought through in a way which I think we would see as very Japanese in its thinking and, and probably over elaborate. However, it did address sort of the, the real issues of, of how to make more economic constructions and so on, how to make things that could be factorized. Now, I, I actually don't think what's being proposed necessarily makes a great deal of sense, but it was struggling to make, make environments that would be appropriate, and you can see from the, from the nature of the animations a serious concern about the actual process. I compare this with having seen the Jesperson um, systems under construction. Um, I, I knew a lot about it because when I, when it took, I took a year out between the third and fourth year, I, as most people did then, uh, most of my colleagues went to work in architectural offices. I went to work for a builder instead. I worked for John Lang's research and development department, doing two things. One was looking at long-term futuristic development of housing systems, and the other was troubleshooting on the ones they've got. And one of the best ones with the Jesperson system is when they managed to build a whole terrace back to front. I'll uh, just explain what happened. Um, you have to visualize there's a whole series of terraces and uh, they're building, building these concrete slabs, and there's a crane run every other row. And so the crane run is, is handy either side in order to minimize the number of cranes. Now, the slabs have to come from the factory in the right order, because obviously, if you've got them stacked up on the lorry, you've got to place the first one first and the last one last. Now, at the top of the site, there was an existing road, and at some point in the process, somebody thought it would save time to use this extra road. So the lorries went along there. But of course, that was for the other handing. So they managed to construct the whole of one terrace back to front. Well, now, <laughs> this is spectacular, because you've seen all those slats have special purpose holes it made in them in the, in the factory, where all the plumbing ducts and things, the staircases are going to go. So suddenly they were faced with this fact that all the houses further down the site all were thought out in terms of south-facing living rooms and kitchens and access. And suddenly, all they got to take them to pieces. At that point, they discovered it was almost impossible to take these to pieces. So I had a lot of experience of actually watching these things actually happen on site in the mud and the guys struggling and looking at people who were in hospital who'd been injured due to the difficulties of doing these things on site, and just contrasting with that, that with a Japanese approach. I'm not saying that I think that's good, it's purely a good contrast. And the point of mentioning it now is because we're going to mention robotic making of parts, and of course robotic assembly of those goes with it, and the fact that the Japanese are now reviving an interest in this, I think is, is, is significant. Um, um, Julia and I recently visited computer um, computer-controlled uh, manufacturing plant by people like Permastalista in Turin, where they actually make these beautiful cladding panels under, under computer control. And these robots move around the factory, making all the varying parts. So first of all, the naivety of the 60s where we're trying to minimize the number of variants. With, depending on the technique being used, now it costs very little extra to make all the panels different, or a significant number of them different. 
Uh, they still have the same problem on site of getting the right ones in the right place. If you think of the roof of the British Museum, um, I've forgotten how many variants there are, but it's something like 2,000 or more different nodes and 9,000 or something different triangular shapes. Not casting, once you're driving a laser beam to cut a piece of glass, it doesn't really make much difference what route it takes. However, it does cost to get that one in the right place. You know, how do you know, because they all look identical, they're all labeled, of course, but you've got them to identify this back to the, back to the, um, to the drawings. Anyway, I can't find those slides, so I'm just going to show instead some other CNC equipment, which is also relevant, because these, all these are just modeled, they're just the same thing on a smaller scale. Um, mainly used for fashion, actually, at Hong Kong where we did that. They, they um, cutting, using the laser cutter, cut these intricate patterns out of leather, which was very beautiful. The thing was, have you ever thought what it might smell like to cut leather with a laser cutter? It's like burning flesh. It's um, printer fabric, printers, knitting machines that knit three-dimensional objects. This is also relevant to the, to the construction industry because of knitting reinforcing for some components and routing to, these are all just computer-controlled multi-axis machines, two and three axis. And all that happens when you get to permanent the least there is you say, see the same thing, but in fact it's so, so large you can't see the other end. And, and they're making these really beautiful, beautiful panels. And that's how things like the gear is now showing were constructed by sending computer instructions direct to the machine. And because there's no step in between, you've got very high control over the process. And then three axis, three axis milling machines, where you can make 3D prototypes and so on. Now, coming out of that, that's a, that's a wax prototype, but is that object, and so this is a bad slide, um, can you think what, what that is and which building it might be from? Any guesses? It's in the spirit of Christmas, we're going to have a, a quiz on Friday with prizes. <coughs> well, this one, no prize today, is one of the stones out of Gaudi's Sagrada Familia. Um, it's uh, a, a prototype of a very complex piece where each of these parts is itself cut out of ruled surfaces, partly have hyperbolic graboids and other conics, and fitting them together. All, all that Gaudi had left of this is a, a, a tiny element on one sketch and one broken plaster, a bit of plaster model, very badly damaged in the Civil War. And Mark Burry, his job was to try to reconstruct this, and they were having extreme difficulty visualizing some of these stones. So they're building computer models. And so we started making these um, wax um, 3D prototypes for them. And now they've installed all this equipment in the model making shop at, in, in, um, in Barcelona. Um, the point about this really is to say, well, th there's nothing about these tools that means that they have to be, you know, just equally appropriate to dealing with Gaudi's geometry as any other. So there, it's there somewhere in the picture. That's Mark and myself going up to look at the prototype of one of these cars. That's not the one. In fact, it's there. It's very hopelessly photographed. It, it's that big. But it's quite a surprise to meet this thing full size because they cut it from the computer instructions. Um, and so that the same process is going on now to construct the, the Sagrada. As is going on to build a Gary, it's the exact same technology, but in this case, the computer instructions to make these shapes are going straight to the Permastilista factory, who is then making the cladding panels to very fine tolerances. The problem, and the, 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 it's almost a, a farce, is the steel work, because of American trades unions, um, they make this to very bad tolerances indeed. Um, I mean, we're talking about things being like as far as 100, 200 millimeters out. And onto that, you're trying to put two millimeter cladding. Now, this is clearly ludicrous. And the way they do it is that they have adjustable brackets, which are designed by the Permastilista company. And the Permastilista the cladding company comes and puts these brackets on, and they have lasers on site, composed by the control, by the computer, and the lasers, three lasers, um, converge on each bracket. The guy, though, with a spanner, checks the lights and tightens up the flat, and that puts the bracket in the right place. I think this is absolutely ludicrous way of building anything, but it's the way in which the model can resolve a, a fundamental contradiction in the logic of the, the American construction industry, and in a way, the logic of a building which wants finer tolerances on the outside than the thing that's supporting them. 
Normally, you use one trait to cover up the errors of the next. In this case, if we're not careful, it exaggerates them because if you've got the smallest bit out on these curves, they look really bad. And there are some mistakes on, um, on the Disney constant model. And of course, the other thing is it makes these buildings economic. I mentioned uh, yesterday that the starter building at MIT is only median cost for this kind of building. And it's because they can so tightly control the cost of making these parts, and they arrive like a kit of parts. But whether or not you like the architecture, whether or not you think it's sensible, it's quite different sort of kit of parts to the, to the baker. And of course, they can be varied and cut um, uh, to, to make uh, a, a vocabulary, the architectural vocabulary, which is much richer. I'm not making any value judgments about that. I'm just simply pointing out that the technology now enables that to happen for better or worse. What I was going to explain to you is how parametrics works using this example of a, of a stadium. The stadium is very difficult because of the sight lines to change the design. And in this case, they've got, I've forgotten how many seats there were, something like 20,000 seats in this, in this arena. These are ice hockey bubbles. And, they, and, and you've got the problem that the, the, the most optional way of getting the sight lines of the, of the, of the seating to see the exciting bits of the game is often incompatible with the kind of shape that they want to do for the roofing to get an economic roofing construction. So there's a complicated problem here. Now these parameterized um, systems allow you to, to play with this like putty. And while you're playing and pulling it about, everything else is being looked after. So you can manipulate this shape and, and everything else logically follows. Every single seat will then, be re will be then changed to make sure it still lines up. It'll check the costing of the seats, the sight lines, everything. And this one is another example. And building everything in triangles like this, of course, enables you to make very complex surfaces. However, um, the triangles I pointed out are, uh, are intrinsically more expensive than would be the case if they could make them in quadrilaterals. However, you can't approximate so easily the shape using quadrilaterals. And you've got this problem of forgetting the shape identity. <coughs> so what's happening here is a piece of software is taking the shape and is attempting to quadrilateralize it to the maximum efficiency. And the, the hot and cold areas here are showing up where there is a, a misfit in order to get a, a, a kind of sensible curve with a square part. It's getting a misfit further and further from the design intention. Question is, is, is the architect happy with that or not? Um, and the, the power of these systems to allow you to just play with something in fluid space, yet at the same time it's looking after the, the fabrication intent is the Cree word here. So the economics of this, the fabrication intent, to be built into it. The Alta this is um, Martin Rees. This is only interesting because if they didn't design anything here at all, this is totally um, parametrically driven. The whole design shape, the whole thing, it's, it's glass. Um, McFarlane was the engineer, and it's structural glass, the beams are glass, glass showings, glass, everything was glass. And all the drawings were generated um, automatically from the scripting code of the, of the program. And of course, it's economic to cut because again, all the instructions go straight to the laser thing. Now, Martin, this is Martin's slide. Martin has added the little remark in here. Manifestation of automation becomes part of the architectural expression. Now, that's his idea, but it's an interesting one to see how other people are thinking about this. He actually wants to create an aesthetic out of the manifestation of the process. I throw that in because people after yesterday's lecture were asking me um, about aesthetics. And again, um, I wanted to show that there are a range of interpretations of what can be done. That is not necessarily my view at all. However, it's interesting that someone like Martin, who actually is doing this kind of building, comes out with a very strong state. He, he added that to my slide. Um, it was his slide originally. I borrowed the slide and he put it in the last time I left. So I left it there, a little remark in green. Now yesterday we showed this, and I'm going to show one different thing about it today. They're intrinsically economic because once you've got these um, gross models, um, everything else then follows without error. Now let me show you something here. This is 
the, the construction of this is a center core and eight outlying columns. And at intervals up of 80 stories of the building, there are elements of triangulation put in um, for wind bracing against typhoons. Now, if this had been constructed as drawn, these ducts, I don't know whether you can see, actually hit these beams. Now, the nice thing about this software is it automatically alerts everybody to that. But I'm interested, obviously, in the fact that it can go into the loop for energy assessment and optimizing performance. And this building is clearly not optimized in any such way at all. It's optimized only for ease of construction, cost, and constructability. However, the same software and the same process could equally well um, optimize it for, for any other consideration. These are buildings which have not been designed at all. Um, now, what I want to suggest is that the kind of model that this is could just as well be the tower you've just seen. Now see what happens if you imagine that tower going through an iterative process like this. The, this is slowed down, so you can see it, see it running in, 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 in real time for us. But it's only taking microseconds. It's just organized the circulation. It's just making some cavities. And I'll explain in another moment why this curious aesthetic of carved out holes in the building. There's a reason for this, which I get to come to. And each time it goes through, that runs through an environmental assessment package so that, that it can adjust the um, evolutionary algorithm, which is one of the things I'm going to explain on tomorrow in the computer's tale, how those work. It adjusts those in order to optimize that performance. So each run produces different outcomes, but part of the same kind of family. I just want to say I think the moment has come in history where this is going to happen. And part of the evidence was that is the number of books about the construction industry that have just come out. And another reason is things like the symposium at the Royal Society, um, very well attended. Um, this was a few years ago now. And each speaker in turn, that's Jim Glynn from Gary's, and Hugh Whitehead from Foster's, Martin Simpson from Arabs, Mario Perrin from Pernas de Lista, the, the guys who actually make the parts of these buildings, Mark Burry from our own the academic theorist doing the Sagrada Familia, and so on in an open forum, they are all saying the same thing, that this is the only way for the construction industry to go. And I said yesterday when I showed that model, is that um, it's so successful, although it's don't, got no further than a hole in the ground, that um, Swa are already starting using it on their next project over the border in China. And it's being considered for projects all over the world. There are very interesting legal issues, though, about who owns the model and copyright and who takes responsibility for mistakes. And this was dealt with, and perhaps one of the reasons it happened first in Hong Kong with Swa is that Swa indemnified all the other, um, other specialist subcontractors and uh, designers, the architects, the concert displayers, the um, services, the engineering, were all indemnified by SWA, so SWA owned the model and responsible for any mistakes. Now, this is a very interesting kind of legal move. And we're caught up in all this, and, and my argument to you at the moment is, that, as far as I'm concerned, I see this as fitting into the total picture for the good, but I'm also offering it to you as a potential problem and threat. There was another of these symposiums at MIT, uh, similar kind of agenda, similar kind of response. Everybody's saying the same, they're going to do it this way. Arabs are moving over to 3D modeling worldwide for all projects and so on. There's no way back. Now the question is how to be in there influencing it and, and making sure it's not being dominated by the, the urges of the property developers. So I just want to go back and, and touch on one issue here, which is one particular thing, which is solar energy. Um, this is from uh, Cambridge around about 1970. Um, where we had always had the students um, doing solar experiments. They, they always built physically some kind of solar collector. This is a parabolic collector onto a, onto a tube as a way of trying to draw their attention to the issues. And um, I'm, I'm very concerned that at the level um, going around the schools of art of the world, um, that this is not an issue. And I'm going to show an example of that in a moment. That in um, 1993 at the AA, we got um, involved with the students trying to develop um, new, new solar tools to help get the geometry right. 
uh, we were doing a project for Ken Yang in Kuala Lumpur. Now Ken um, is a great enthusiast for um, uh, ecologically and environmentally um, sustainable and reliable and, and responsible architecture, um, yet Ken is one of those who gets his solar geometry wrong. Um, he gets very angry with me for saying this, but I was his tutor when he wrote his PhD about this, and he got it wrong then, and he's got it wrong ever since. Um, so we were trying very hard to persuade Ken to get it right, and started building him new tools, which included new computer tools that helped you to visualize the path of the sun, and so these were for different um, latitudes. Um, now you may wonder why we, why we had to do this. One of the things at the time was that MicroStation had a solar part in its program, and it was wrong too, we discovered when we tested it. Maybe he tests these things and checks them. And I think it's right now, I must say, in due respect to MicroStation, they did put it right when we pointed it out. And we built this little 3D protractor which allows you to predict where the sun is at any latitude, any time of the day, any season of the year, to help visualize this because Architects pride themselves on their three-dimensional imagination, um, but I won't embarrass you, but I'm pretty sure that if I put this to the test in this room right now, um, that a significant number of you might have some difficulty uh, working out correctly um, the solar geometry parts. And given, therefore, this was a common problem, um, we did this, and we got help from unlikely quarters. Ken Yang supported the main project, and. Um, Norman Foster paid for these models to be made, for example. So there was considerable interest in, in that issue. Um, and I just touch on this because at the same period, um, we were involved in trying to make structures that interacted on a, on a smaller time scale. One of the questions that came up yesterday was about time scales. And of course, we're talking about some things which are, are looking well into the future, some things which would take through the design of any one building, some things which move on a day-to-day -day basis, like solar sort of crisis proposals for the generator in the front palace, through to things that might move on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, like we can open and close these blinds or shut the windows, but we might have parts of buildings that move economically, tracking the sun, tracking solar collectors and so on. This was just a simple demonstration um, between two um, space frames made of tetrahedra uh, and uh, wire and tension, Secondly, tetrahedra, there is a building membrane of a mesh. And the idea is simply that there are, um, there are slight sensitive um, detectors spread all over the surface of this. And in the exhibition, behind it, this light is tracking backwards and forwards in an arc. And as it tracks, the little solar um, sensitive cells um, start um, triggering um, wire motors which are pulling tensing wires in this, which are then bending and flexing this structure. The point of this really was just to emphasize that parts of buildings might move on quite a, 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 a small scale, a short time scale. One of the students in that group, um, Gianni, um, took up this theme um, of, of solar logic um, very seriously. This is the following year or year after. And did a whole study, these are Im images from his presentation, of trying to really come to terms with a, with a deep understanding of the behavior of the sun and the difference between sunlight and daylight, which get beautifully colored, and also the social and um, other cultural effects. We're not just talking about trying to get solar energy. We're not just talking about trying to keep the sun out of buildings in the tropics. We're talking about um, all kinds of other social and historical and, um, um, and um, factors involving the sun, which um, are all part of the same argument. And so Gianni produced a very um, elegant overall um, argument about this, and then talked about tree architectures and strategies. And I, I'm going to talk about this on, on Friday. But the, the, the whole of nature, all the variety of plant life, revolves around only 24 different strategies, tree architectures. It's interesting that biologists use that word, tree architectures to show the different ways in which trees can be formed in plants. Only there are three ways of making a leaf bud, and only 24 ways of making the whole plant. And that produces fantastic wealth and variety of plants across the planet. So Gianni was interested in trying to find a similar kind of thing to do with solar logic. Um, and so this is his overall model for applying solar logic into an urban problem. That's just the mathematics of it. 
matrices, and he found different ways of trying to illustrate uh, solar um, behavior to the normal ways of doing it. And we were using, as I've shown in other days, these isotropic isostation models consisting of the basically close packing spheres. So he started applying the solar logic to those models. So these are um, just the Groningen, which was the, was the area we're looking at. These are the solar models of Groningen, but expressed as the behavior of the cells in one of those isospatial models. For the benefit of those who will miss those lectures and don't know what an isospatial model is, I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, so these are isospatial representation of solar energy vectors, basically showing a visual representation of the solar energy, but in a way which can feed back into the model to influence the growth of it. And so these go down layer by layer, and of course, um, each one influences the layer below, and that produces these building envelopes. Now, I've repeated this kind of remark in other lectures, but I will say it yet again, that these were not the propositions for buildable form, but they were the envelopes of particular kind of solar geometries. So, I mean, you could build that as a solar skin, um, and it being optimized for maximum exposure, um, at certain times of the year, a minimum direct solar impingement at others, and so on, in a quite a complex manner. And that's how the, the geometry of the lines, the vectors, intersects with the balls representing them. So where did all this get in? That's the sort of, the total, the totality of his kind of trying to put a grasp on the effect of solar logic on this town plan. What happened is this, each student looked at a specialist area. We all, we all had one computer model of the whole of Groningen, which is what I, I showed very briefly on the first day, and will show a little bit more of on the last day. But each student took a specialist interest. It's of course that they're all using one model, and it means each one of them can get to some up level of understanding of one aspect of it, and then share the rest. The problem, of course, is it's not that easy to integrate them. So one of the weaknesses of that kind of approach from a teaching point of view is you get some fragmentation, um, non-integration. But the model itself was, was integrated. So all the different things, the desire lines, the solar logic, the ca catastrophe, the metabolism, um, were all integrated or tried to be integrated in one model. But frankly and honestly, it was really layered rather than integrated would be the honest way of describing it. Now, um, Gianni then applied that to this house in London. Now, I'm going to show this um, both in some um, hesitation because it's, it's, a very, it's a very trivial example. Um, however, it's important because A, it, for me, it shows that you can get these techniques right through into a conventional building because most of what we're talking about are relatively unconventional buildings. And this is a relatively conventional building. I know relatively because, first of all, it doesn't have any external windows. It's a house. Um, I know at least four or five people in the audience who've seen it. Um, it's a house in London, and it has no external windows. It's, so it's not quite that conventional. It's also quite large, and instead it has internal um, courtyards. But what is interesting to me is that it applied all these logical, solar logic techniques. The very sad thing is that in the end, the client didn't pay for the solar collectors, um, so that there are no photovoltaic cells on the roof where they should be. However, I have a little idea that they might finish up putting them there in the future, so it's set up for them to do it. Um, so that was disappointing. But other aspects, like the way in which the sunlight and the daylight treated separately penetrate into this house, is I think of great value. So please excuse the small scaleness of this project. Um, and also the time, it took him nine years to get from that solar logic diagram, which I've just shown you, to this building. But there it is being, there's the site plan underneath. It's in Notting Hill Gate. It's in the middle of the Street plan. And those are the spheres of the isospatial model doing an analysis of the sunlight penetration into the space and the daylight diffusion into the space. And so these are the, these are the isospatial points, as it were, of particular kind. Those share each color, 
each tone shares a particular kind of intensity of solar radiation as the levels go down are affected by the levels above and below, depending on what you build. Now that, the important point is that is exactly the same geometry as that, which I've shown you before, dating right back to one of the earlier seeding projects, which is exactly the same geometry as that. So we're seeing the same isospatial geometry running through all, all these different projects. Now you start to see the plan, and the plan now starts to consist of spaces and voids and solid elements, right through, right out to the outer wall, which you can see has no windows. This has got a way in. And that's it in section, three stories, most of it, some of it, four, going down below ground level. And it's upside down now, so you're living up on the first floor, and the studies and things are on the roof and the roof terraces. And there are gardens that come all the way down every level. You get natural sunlight right into the bottom of this through these holes. So some of those spaces you see there are going to make rooms, and some are going to make voids between rooms. And that's it where the bottom of this construction. And you see they're going very, very solid, unpenetrated outside wall. And that, of course, Patrick Janssen had been working with Gianni at that period, three years of this project. So you now see where this particular family of um, artificial family came from. That is, in fact, uh, the Gianni house, but this time an external fenestration. But the carving away from, with all these voids is basically, uh, what you're seeing is the carving of the inside courts and spaces of that house in Notting Hill Gate. This is how all these projects are connected up. And Patrick had worked on the original isospatial model, which did the evolving thing. So all these stories work start to work together. It got very good pest coverage. Jonathan Glancy liked it. Um, very, very glowing comments. I have to show these because the photographs really are very disappointing. You're going to be very disappointed, but never mind. It's a nice project. I think it's lovely. But there are some interesting question marks about the idea of, of building that as a prototype attitude to housing in London. But anyway, um, it's it, it, an interesting Jonathan Glancy um, immediately confuses sunlight and daylight um, and, and this is another problem I, I, I was whining on yesterday about problems of architectural criticism the day before, and particular approaches of historians to the toothpaste theories and so on, and, 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 the, and the Lilliput syndrome of the visual only and so on. And another confusion is, is, is talking about even the simplest things like daylight and sunlight. Direct sunlight penetration is totally different to diffuse daylight, and diffused and reflected sunlight is quite different. Anyhow, Jonathan Lance is perfectly correct that it is in that the qualities of light which make this house. And that's what's not really photograph photogenic. Um, and particularly as we saw this um, just before it's handed over to the client, and it was in November, it was last month, so the sun was very low. And so you're seeing it where uh, almost the worst case scenario for sunlight. That is the entrance. <laughs> and this is the entrance courtyard. It's made of perforated, corrugated, stainless steel, glass, honeycomb glass floors, polished concrete floors, and raw concrete walls, and those are pretty well the only four materials. Um, this staircase, well, as you see, goes all the way up through. Now you can see, start to see what's happening. This, of course, is direct solar penetration right through from two and a half floors above here. Uh, it's coming through. Now, of course, this is November. Uh, and and uh, it, the, the sun is only just skating the roofs of the adjacent building. This is why this has to be worked out so very carefully. Of course, at other times of the year, it starts to come in, and then the solar shading starts to come into, into operation because it will then become too much of a solar track down here. So these are further up the building where the court, these are open spaces, the plants you can see there, here, are coming through from the floor below. So the gardens go all the way down at different levels. There are gardens at every level, it's right through from the, from the ground floor through to the, to the roof, through to the, this is the main living area, terrace. And then the roof itself, which is different variable shading glass and ought to be covered with um, <laughs> photovoltaic cells. Um, um, but, but would be, it is, it is optimally orientated if ever the client decides to add them. Um, and every space you can see immediately the impact of the sunlight coming through and the reflections of the sunlight coming through. 
Um, and he did all that from that little ISS national model. You can see it all the way up to the very roof terrace. There's a swimming pool, which is quite interesting. It's stainless steel. And it's very narrow and long, so you do lengths. The internal gardens are very odd, too. All the stones being imported from Italy. Um, the whole house is prefabricated, I should say, too. I'll explain that in a minute. And you can't get into any of these garden spaces, which is very odd. But that's the client's, that's the client's bathroom at the end of the swimming pool. And the master bathroom, all the bathrooms throughout the house are in stainless steel, and they're all prefabricated in Italy. So this is a kind of, it's a kind of kit of parts thing, again, reminiscent in that sense of, 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 of the 60s, and some of the things I was being critical of. And the, and the vocabulary is fairly conventional. However, the techniques being used, I think, are interesting because it, I, I think it's interesting that, that it's possible to apply them to what is relatively conventional structure. And that's really only the point I'm making. 